The hadith of Jibreel is really considered probably one of the most important hadiths in all of the hadith literature. And the reason for that is it is a summation of the entire Islamic teaching. It sums up Islam. It was also a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ told 80 days before he died. So it's very close to the last period that he was with us in physical flesh. The hadith is related by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who Umar is the second caliph. He is also the second closest person to the Prophet ﷺ in terms of companionship, Abu Bakr being the first. He begins by telling us that they were sitting with the Prophet ﷺ, and then he said a man in white clothes, stark black hair, very striking person, emerges and he says and we could not see any traces of traveling on him now what's interesting about that remark is that this is a desert town medina there's really only a few thousand people living in this town it's a village more than than a city i mean it's considered a city by arabian standards but it is certainly not a place where people didn't know each other people knew everybody there Now, when this man comes in white robes, very clean, very fresh, no signs of traveling, they thought that was strange, which is why he mentions it. Because where did he come from? He would have had to have showered, changed his clothes. Nobody knew where this man came from and nobody had ever seen him before. Well, he sits down and he places his knees against the knees of the Prophet ﷺ, which is very intimate. And then he places his hands on the Prophet Sallallahu thighs. Now in this hadith, which is the one that is the most famous, it doesn't mention it, it just says, وَوَضَعَ كَفَيْهِ عَلَى فَخِذَيْهِ He put his two palms on his thighs. And, but there's another hadith that says, on the Prophet's thighs. Now, there's some reasons for doing that. One, it would have been obviously a very intimate thing to do, as if he would have known the Prophet ﷺ, he wouldn't have done that. And it probably shocked some of the Sahaba because they would not have done that. But the way he sat was uh, an Eastern way of sitting, which is like this. Traditionally, that was the way a student sat. In madrasa, it would have been considered rude not to sit like that. So, and obviously, if you've noticed Persian people and people that can sit like that for long periods of time, it's a very common place. In, uh, in some Muslim countries where they still sit on the floor. So then he says, Akhbirni, Ya Muhammad, an al Islam. Tell me, O Muhammad, Prophet, وسلم, tell me about Islam. Akhbirni an al Islam. And the Prophet وسلم, says, Islam is shahada. That's the first thing he says. That it is an tashhad an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammad Rasulullah. That you testify that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is the Messenger, which is an act, it's not a belief. Shahada is not a belief, it is an act. It is an act done with the tongue. People forget that in Islam, words are considered actions. And Imam Madik said, when you realize that your words are actions, if you have intelligence, your words diminish because you're taken to account for your actions. The more words you have, the more accountability you have. He said, it is to say, an tashhad an la ilaha illa. So that's the first, it's called a rukan, which means a pillar. And a rukan is something you depend upon. It's something that holds other things up. And then he says that you pray, that you pray five times a day. And then he says that you pay zakat, alms tax, You fast during Ramadan, and then you make the pilgrimage to the house if you're able to. At that point, the man says, Sadaqta, you spoke the truth. So the Sahaba, Sayyidina Umar says, Ajibna, you know, we were really dumbstruck at that point. He's asking him, and then he's confirming what he's saying. This is very strange, because he's asking him a question. So now... One of the things that we learn is question is a teaching device. A teacher will ask a question, not because he doesn't know the answer, but because he wants something else to happen. 
So he asks him this question, and they still don't know who this person is. And then he says, now tell me about faith. So we're moving to another dimension of Islam. The first is Islam. Then he says, now tell me about Iman. So here's a distinction between Islam and Iman, which is going to become very important. And then he tells him, faith and tu'mina billah, that you believe in Allah. So now he's not telling him what Iman is, he's telling him what the objects of Iman are, because Iman in and of itself is a mystery. You cannot explain in words what Iman is. The next best thing you can tell is you can explain the objects of belief. Belief itself is, the ulama say it's tasdiq. It is to verify or affirm or have a conviction in one's heart about something. That is what belief is. But he gives him the objects of faith. He tells him it's a belief in Allah, his angels, his books, his messenger, the last day, and that you have faith in this measuring out of the world, that everything is determined and proportioned, and that you believe in both good and evil, which is very interesting because this is a problem in religion, it's called the theodicy, which is the problem of evil. And for Christians, it's probably been the great bugbear of Christianity, of trying to explain the presence of evil in the world. It has never been a problem for the Muslims. The Muslims are not Manichaeists. They don't believe in duality. Muslims have never believed in this idea of two forces antagonistically working in the world. Muslims believe that good and evil are creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Allah is above good and evil in terms of the scales by which we judge them because we don't have the ability to judge good and evil in reality. And that is why we've been given standards, killing is bad. And we don't kill. Stealing is bad. We don't steal. But there are other instances where stealing becomes acceptable. So there's situational ethics. There's instances where killing is acceptable. If you see a man killing another man, the outward act of it is rejected by the heart. But what's happening? What's actually taking place? Is it murder or is it retribution? What's going on? So the act in and of itself is not evil. What is evil is the reason and the intention, which is if it was wrong or oppressive. So it's very interesting that that's part of the creed that Muslims believe in. And then he says, again, he'd spoken the truth, and he says, now tell me about doing what is beautiful. And ihsan is a very difficult word to translate in Arabic. If you look at the root word hasuna, means to be beautiful. That's what it means. Ihsan, if you look at the word ahsana, it means to make something beautiful. It's called the transitive form of the intransitive verb. And if you know English grammar, an intransitive verb does not take an object. A transitive verb takes an object. So hasuna takes no object. You say hasuna zaydun. Zaydun is good. That's what you say. But if you said ahsana zaydun, you need to have an object. What did Zay do that was good. Ahsana Zaydun ila Amrin. Zay did good to Amr. So there, the idea then in Ihsan is it's doing virtuous deeds. It is the act of bringing virtue into the world. And because virtue is the most beautiful thing in the world, it's the highest thing in Islam. Because by doing virtuous deeds, you make the world more beautiful. So doing good in the world is beautifying the world. That's what you're doing and that's what that's about. So he asks him, tell me about what beautiful, and he says, doing beautiful means you should worship God as if you see him. Now, just if you think about what that means, what that means is if you can imagine that you actually are seeing God, How would you behave in the world? How would you treat other people, other creatures of God? How would you treat God's creation? If you go to somebody's house, you don't spit on their carpet. You don't urinate in the corner of the room. Why? Because it's not your house. 
and you have to behave with proper comportment in the house. And the better behavior that you have, the more likely that he'll invite you back. So the idea of being in the world as if you see God is the idea that you are a guest in a dominion that belongs to God. And that if you actually behave in the world as if you see him, you will behave appropriately. You will behave with excellent manners. You will behave beautifully. And that's at the essence of Ihsan. And then he says, And even if you don't see him, at least you know that he sees you. So the highest stage of ihsan is really to be as if you see God. But if you don't, at least you know he sees you so that your behavior is still appropriate. And then he says, tell me about the hour. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the one being questioned does not know more than the one asking the question. In other words, the, the moment that the world ends is a secret. And so he says, then tell me about its amarat, its signs, its marks. So this is the signs of the latter days. The Prophet ﷺ says, the slave girl gives birth to her mistress. Now the ulama have always considered this a very unusual statement, but the ulama have gone into three dominant interpretations. One of them is that it is the turning upside down of social order. That right becomes wrong, wrong becomes right, uh, high people become low, low people become high, that this is what happens. And so the idea of a mistress giving birth to a slave, if you invert that, it's the ama, al amatu teridu rabbataha, all right? The servant gives birth to her master. It's an inversion of reality, it's what's called qalb al haqaiq. So you see the slave girl give birth to her mistress. One of the interpretations also is that it means children will become completely rebellious against their parents, which in Confucian understanding is the worst possible sign in a human society when filial piety no longer exists because the whole social order is based on the authority of the family. And the thing about families, families are not just children are in a despotic situation parents are tyrants basically but what the ethicists say is that justice is only necessary in the absence of love so the reason that we tolerate family situations is because of that other element that exists which is love in other words we know that the parent is doing what they do out of love for the child so when the parent doesn't allow the child to eat what's harmful, candy or whatever, or doesn't allow the child to watch television, or doesn't allow, these are apparently arbitrary moves on behalf of the parent to the child. So the child experiences is it as really a type of tyranny. And I, I always love the one where the child's like crawling and the parent comes and just picks it up and goes another direction. I mean, if you just look at a total act of despotism, I mean, that is a real act of arbitrary, despotic behavior. <laughs> But obviously there's a, a reason, and that's why it's not uh, tyrannical. It's on the contrary, it's benevolent. So, and then the man went away, and after we had waited, لبستو maliya. you know, he says we waited a time, some say it was three days, it was a period of time. At which point the Prophet ﷺ said, do you know who the questioner was, Omar? It's interesting, he waited a few days. He said, do you know who that questioner was? And this was also a sign that the Sahaba didn't ask the Prophet unnecessary questions. Because you would think Omar would have said, who was that, Ya Rasulullah? But they weren't like that. They were people that, that just, they asked what was absolutely necessary to ask. The Prophet ﷺ said, This was Jibreel who has come to teach you your religion. Hada Jibreel atakum yu'allimukum dinukum. The meaning of that is that this hadith teaches us the religion. That's the whole religion right there. Iman, Islam, Ihsan, and signs of the last day. 